Isma sits Isidro and Shirakid down to treat them to some potato, fish, and seaweed soup, and I honestly would try it, it doesn't sound that bad to me. Anyways, she's excited to meet with a witch that the great Isidro was telling her about. Great Isidro is likely a title that he bestowed upon himself, that's just a wild guess of mine. So Shirake was immediately able to sense something that was off about Isma, and it's all but confirmed as Isma herself claims to be the child of a human and a marrow, meaning that her dad was a fisherman who got down with a mermaid. Now I've seen the lighthouse and that sort of thing seemed like it would not yield good results. Actually now that I think about it, if I picture Willem Dafoe as Bonebeard the pirate, it kind of makes that character a lot more enjoyable. But anyway, I'm still not sure how the biological mechanics of having sex with a mermaid would work, but as you imagine, in the Berserk lore, mermaids are similar to elves in that they are on the positive spectrum of the astral slash magical creatures, protectors and spirits of the sea itself, regarded as good omens and rarely seen by humans. In fact, Isma herself has never actually seen a marrow despite fishing on the island her entire life, and her mother supposedly being one. She also claims to be an outcast of the island because of her rumored lineage. It takes it back to the legends and superstitions of the island and its sea god. Of course, I've talked before about how I think in the Berserk story that rumors and building up of ideas of different things can will them into reality, but it also has to do with remembering the past, and as generations go by, the true story gets murkier and murkier as the ideas spread. According to Isma, the sea god once ruled around the area, devouring people in ships, and when the full moon approaches, as most astral creatures do, it becomes more present and powerful, extending its tentacles deep into the ocean and attacking and controlling full ships, which explains what happened to our pirate boys. So it wasn't a kraken, it was just part of the sea god. Now up until this point, the most gigantic creature Berserk has presented us with was Ganeshka's Shiva form, which by all accounts was kaiju levels of massive and something completely unprecedented in this world, and something that was unnatural in its existence. But the sea god is so massive that it might actually rival Shiva to a degree, and it does occur naturally, if that's the right phrase to use about it. In my personal headcanon, and this is not stated anywhere in Berserk, just to be clear, but I would personally like to attribute the sheer size and power of the sea god to a culmination of mankind's general fear of the sea. The fear of drowning, getting lost, starving, fish, creatures, and monsters that lurk beneath its surface, and just the sheer size of the darkness that the ocean represents. They often say don't look too deeply into the ocean at night or you could be called in and never return. The mystery and grandeur of the ocean pulls on a deep primal fear within us and I would like to believe, again it's not stated, but I would like to believe that the sea god exists as kind of a representation of mankind's fear of the unknown involving all of the world's oceans. And according to Isma, many years ago, the Marrows were actually able to confine the Sea God to this island in particular, perhaps trapping it until the great roar of the astral world awakened it once more. Thank you, Griffith. Back in the strange tavern, I like this little back and forth between Roderick and Magnifico. Even though Magnifico quickly got placed into the comedy relief category after his introduction, it was presented that he and Roderick are still friends to a degree, so I really enjoy them interacting together as friends. Also, I like how Guts is quiet and just focusing on Casca, keeping an eye on her. But in this next page turn, we get perhaps one of the creepiest Berserk double page spreads of all time. Roderick opens the door of the tavern to see dozens upon dozens of weird, fleshy, seaweedy looking people, these things, just staring at the tavern. Berserk has done epic and gory images galore in its entire run, but just as the dark, blank silence of this moment, I think it makes it one of the most terrifying and creepy panels in the entire manga. I don't know, that's just my opinion. From inside the tavern, the chef speaks telling them that this is the full moon and the Easter of the Sea God. Maybe I'm being pessimistic here, but I don't think that that means the Sea God is going to be dressing up like a bunny and taking kids questions in a mall. But if he did, I think Guts would react this way. Wait in line like everybody else. What the hell is this? This is for Brody. <laughs> 
Instead, Guts just chucks a knife into the chef's eye like nothing, and the whole team prepares for whatever battle is about to come. It's them versus the many tentacles of the godlike monster. And it's great because at this point the team, well, minus Magnifico, they really know the score of what's going on. Guts begins his traditional hack and slash, Serpico takes out his sylph sword, noting that it seems to be even stronger, giving that it's a full moon, which increases the strength of the elementals within his weapon. Farnese controls the thorn snakes that she was given by Shirake, and Roger just old schools it with his trusty saber. That guy's a badass. And they make it outside the tavern where they are face to face with the reality of this situation. An insane amount of tentacles implying that the inhabitants of the entire island have all been assimilated into the sea god. Guts does every badass trick in the book trying to annihilate the onslaught without having to tap into the berserker armor. This means lots of cannon blasts, which are always fucking badass to see. Now last time he was able to manipulate the armor where he could use its potential and not lose his mind in the process, you know, the Batman guts. Meh. But before, Shirke was there to help him with that. Now she is away with Isidro, Isma, and the elves. And so Guts is basically on his own here for right now. And he stops to reload his cannon and actually come to think of it, is this the first time we've seen him actually have to reload it? I don't know, I just really like that little detail. But anyway, we get the return of, yes, Bonebeard the douchebag, I, I mean the pirate. I'm not going to go over a lot of his dialogue because it really is kind of self-indulgent and I know it's there for humor but it, it just annoys me. But his whole ship pretty much crash lands right in front of the tavern and it is also part of the Sea God. Remember we haven't even gotten to the full body of the Sea God yet. So far, our characters are only fighting its tentacles, which that's just insane. And as the pirate ship explains, once you become eaten, you become part of the sea god itself, which is the intention here. It's also an excuse for Miura to show off his skills, drawing massive splash pages like this of the tentacles, of slug creatures, and just uh, all around just madness. With this overwhelming circumstance, Guts looks to Casca, and I feel like here is just the simplicity of the instinct to protect. His face immediately turns away, and the helmet of the armor begins to take over, just like a parasite latching onto a host. The anxiety of Guts using the armor has been used a few times now in the story. It was used in its introduction against Grunbeld, facing the Pashaka on the beach, and when they were trying to escape for Tannis. So this is technically the fourth time, and by this time, even I have to admit, though the tension is still there, it does begin to lack an impact since Guts has managed to get out of the Berserker Armor Rage each time now. It's just the more you use it, the more you get used to it in the story, and maybe that's the intent as we will get used to it and then at some point the armor will be inescapable, who knows. My question when reading this segment of the story wasn't so much of would the armor give him trouble, but it was how he would defeat a creature that is what you would imagine a god to be. Not like the god hand with powers beyond our understanding, but just something that is so physically large and powerful, like the size of the entire island. Like I said, so far they're only fighting its tentacles. Could even the berserker armor help with something like that? Well, Guts is gonna try, as he slashes through as many pieces of it as he can, including an iconic page and one of my favorite ever images of the berserker armor in the entire manga. Just look how godly this page is. There's also this one as well with the cape folding down around the armor itself. And oh god, this one of him using the helmet of the armor to bite through the eye of one of the slugs. Just god damn. If anything, the art in the Sea God segment of the manga is worth reading it for just, just the art alone, I swear to god. Anyway, Shirake and the others approach and she senses that the entire island has been assimilated. Well, the entire island except for Isma. Something to do with the strange ode that Shirake sends from her, no doubt, and also from the amulets that were surrounding her home. As in she was meant to be protected for some reason. And Isma was introduced in this story pretty late, though it's relative to say late because we don't know how much longer the manga will actually go on. But who and what she is will have a direct purpose into this segment of the arc, but I also believe that her presence is important for what the Fantasia arc represents as a whole. But I'll get more into that one later. Shirke does manage to see Guts from a distance and attempts to connect with him on an astral level, but it's almost like the armor itself is rejecting her. 
The armor is magical in its nature, and perhaps because of the full moon, it itself increases the nature of the armor. Just as the sea god is assimilating people, it's almost as if the armor must assimilate with its host in a similar way, suppressing the humanity of the user in order to embrace their inner darkness and unleash it upon the enemy. Pasca begins to run off from the battle and Farnese chases after her right away, even slashing her creature on her way. Good for you, Farnese. One of the slugs appears before Casca, but Guts super jumps onto its back and just slashes it into pieces. Though the group is still unsure if Guts did that to protect Casca or if it was just part of his berserker rage. And once again, Serpico steps in front of the group to try to protect them in case Guts goes mad. This is the second time that he's done this, and I'm telling you, even though Serpico accepted his defeat by Guts, that doesn't mean that he automatically trusts him or that they're best buddies now. Serpico will never be to Guts what a Judo or a Pippin was. And I would say that Serpico is the most apprehensive towards Guts in many ways, and he is justified in those feelings. Just look at the situation that they're in. For within Guts, the Beast of Darkness, the manifestation of Guts' darkest thoughts, rage, and fears, is breaking its chains and telling Guts to yield himself into it. In order to master this Berserker armor, to master this rage, this negativity within him, it means taming this beast. But in their heated moments when the blood is pumping and his vision is blurred, how could he ever hope to do so? Well, that comes from another voice, one that's not his own, but tells him to look at Casca. Casca, the entire reason for his journey and why he's here in the first place. His love for her, the only emotion stronger than his rage. Being reminded by a familiar touch, this moment has also happened before. The astral form of a boy, the same one that was on the beach and mysteriously disappeared soon after. The Moonlight Child, as he is referred to by fans, still yet to be named, but most certainly the child of Guts and Casca. Guts' own child, his son, calming down his mind from within the astral realm and releasing control of the Beast of Darkness within Guts' mind. As Shuriken and the others arrive, she jumps on this opportunity. I mean, like, she literally jumps onto Guts' back, trying to enter the armor with him as she did in Britannus, and to help him hold back the beast and control the armor as he desires. This image of little Shirake ripping the helmet back and pulling it off like pulling a mad dog off of a victim, it's, it's such an iconic image. And the wholesome moment after of Guts thanking her, and it just reminds me of why I love Berserk and why I love Guts so much, that after every hardship, there's still times to bring a sigh of relief and still time to have gratitude and thanks towards the people that are helping you. But then the group notices the reason Casca ran off in the first place, that the Moonlight Boy is here once more. In no way it could be a coincidence. How could a little boy manage to travel the distance that they did and wind up on this random island as well? He traveled here by other means, and was just in time to help Guts, and again, Casca was instinctively drawn towards him. Guts straight up asked the boy if it was indeed him that helped Guts restrain the armor, but the boy again refuses to speak in the physical world, or perhaps it's unable to, we're not really sure. Isma then introduces herself to the group, and Isidro pleads with Roderick to please let her join the ship, and Roderick, being the, you know, super fucking cool dude that he is, he of course welcomes her. This is Roderick. Come on, the dude's a badass. The plan now for the group is to leave the island ASAP and hope that the minimal repairs to the ship are enough to get them where they're going. But Guts realizes that the Sea God will still be able to attack them at sea where they will be more vulnerable, and so he opts to take the fight straight to it. Meanwhile, Shirake will protect the ship and the Moonlight Boy will come along, I suppose, as it clings to Casca without saying a word. However, once reaching the ship, Shirake is entrusting the protection of the spell to Farnese. Farnese, who has been steadily proving herself that she is very useful to the group and is now tasked as its protector. Similar to how Shirake entered the Astral World and asked for protection from the four elemental kings back during the troll battle, Farnese will now have to do something similar. She has yet to truly master creating and maintaining her luminous body, the thing that allows her to travel through the Astral World, but with Shirake's guidance and the full moon enhancing astral power, Farnese is in the perfect position to accomplish this task, having the faith from everybody on board. How far she has come within this manga since her introduction, Farnese has truly become an incredible character, and I am sorry for ever doubting her. 
Meanwhile, once the protection barrier will be around the ship, once Farnese manages to enact it, Shurike will accompany Guts, well, astrally anyways, to help him keep the armor in check, as Guts plans to go, by himself, straight into the cave that will lead him to the mouth of the Sea God. Thank you everybody for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. That'll do it for part two of the Fantasia arc. Many parts yet to come. Very excited to get through this arc with you guys. Well, as far as we can. And uh, hopefully Miura will continue this arc and we'll have a great final finish to it. There is a new chapter coming out this month, so be on the lookout for that for a review. The analysis series will continue, hopefully two episodes a month. We'll see how it goes. Thank you guys for watching it. I really do appreciate it. I appreciate the support. Please like this video. Please comment down below at this portion of the story or anything you'd like to comment. Subscribe to the channel if you want to stick around and see more. Discord and Patreon links are in the description below if those kind of things are your cup of tea. Other than that, guys, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you in the next video.